Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy here on Autism Live. And we've got a great guest who's going to be joining us via Skype right now, Judith Newman. And she is the author of the book that everybody's talking about right now, To Siri with Love. Uh, Judith, we want to welcome you here. Judith, is this is not her first book, and we, we need to say that. She's a wonderful, wonderful writer, and this book is getting a great deal of attention because it's, I, I think it's getting attention because it's so well written and it's, so accessible for people who, whether you've got a kid that's on the spectrum or you don't, um, there's a you've got a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, you've written for many things. In fact, you had this originally started w- with an article that was in the New York Times that we covered when it was out originally right, as one right, of our in the news right. uh, things. To Siri with To Siri with Love was an original story in the New York Times, right? So oh, yeah, it was. Oh, I didn't even know. So there you go. Here we are. Here so, we are. Tell us how this whole, all this developed from it becoming an article to a book. Yeah, well, I, I mean, essentially, uh, I, I wrote about this. It, it, it developed the way a lot of stories that I write develop, strangely. I just wrote something uh, guilt ridden on Facebook. I just said something about, you know, my God, I'm a horrible mother. This is what I did. And my editor at the Times, who lurks to see these things, said, you know, you should write about that. So that's what happened. But essentially, uh, it, it was nothing more than sitting around noodling with Siri myself. I was looking at it, and it, it had so many, it, it, there was some BuzzFeed column about what you can do with Siri. And so uh, one of the things it said was uh, you could tell what you ask Siri what planes are flying overhead and it will tell you and it does and I, I thought to myself it gives you that like the name of the, the flight and that with the altitude and everything and I, and I just sort of was talking to myself and I murmured out loud why in God's name would anyone need to know this and I hadn't even realized Gus was listening to me and he said well so you know who you're waving at mommy and then <laughs> I sort of was like oh Okay, you know, and then I, I gave him Siri because he was sort of curious, and that started it. You know, he just found uh, great, like he was completely riveted by this little uh, device that was going to answer all of his odd little questions. Yeah, one of the things I love is that you described that, you know, she's the ultimate companion in, in terms of patience when you want research and to talk about little known facts. And we, I don't think any of us really had thought about that before, but it resonates with everyone. Uh, it does resonate with everyone. I mean, there's a reason that when you are sitting around and you go, so Siri, what are you up to? Siri has, you know, five different answers for what she's doing this evening. It's, it's not just uh, people on the spectrum who are talking to Siri. I think all of us, you know, in a moment of boredom, when we discover that Siri will talk back to us, yeah. uh, we, we in fact uh, can't help ourselves. And we, we, we sit there and we start talking. I certainly know I start talking to her every now and then. I was just doing it the other day. So, um, but, but it, it ha- I think Siri holds a special place um, for kids and for kids who are communications impaired. I don't know if you've ever uh, ha- had your own kids play with Siri a little bit. Yes, my son likes to change the voice on it oh, and have he? and the language. Okay, uh, but yes, we we play with it, and I, I it, it has has Wyatt ever played? He has not played with it. It might be a fun thing to see what Wyatt yeah. does with it and to see how Siri responds right. to it. And it and I think. I, I love, there are so many things that you describe in this book that I love, Judith. I love that you talk, I, I think it might even be in the introduction, you talk about the, the emails that you got from people after the New York Times report. Tell, tell them about what somebody from Russia said. Oh, it, it was wonderful. Um, a woman in, in kind of halting English, or not halting, but, but it, clearly English wasn't her first language. She told me, <clears throat> she was... <clears throat> excuse me, a translator for Siri. Uh, that was her job. And she told me that now when she uh, is translating, she would think of Gus because she would think, <clears throat> excuse me, of his emotional reactions 
to, uh, to, to what she was uh, playing around with, to how she was uh, making the language work. Yeah, I love it. She said, I see that I need to make my Siri in Russian a kinder, gentler, more patient, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we're all going to have the throat tickle now. Yeah. We're, yeah. <laughs> even through Skype, we're passing it around. Such. And I, you know, I have had the experience before driving my car and asking, you know, having Hey Siri right. and asking Siri for something and not being able to get the answer I wanted because I wasn't asking in the right terms. Mm -hmm. And then finally, in frustration, saying, Siri, I am so frustrated with you right now. And I, <laughs> I, I like just yelling at her. And then oh, this yeah. moment of quiet and her saying, I'm really sorry to hear that, Shannon. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. And, which yeah, calmed me down. Sometimes she'll actually say, you don't need to yell. <laughs> yeah. I, I've had that come out of her mouth, too. You know, she'll say, she she does, um, uh, she militates politeness in a way. Now, you know, t to us, that's just funny. But if your communication's impaired and you're not quite sure what's polite and what's not, it's also very useful. And yeah. it was certainly... <clears throat> very, very useful for Gus. Is that what do you think made him resonate so much with it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, what made it resonate for him? I, I, it was a few things. Uh, number one, who is more patient than a machine? You know, at the point, I'm, I'm sure that we as mothers have all had this this feeling sometimes when our kid neurotypical or not, but particularly on the spectrum, our kid is just obsessing about something on and on and on and on. And there's only so many times you want to answer that question. Yes. Um, and you finally just kind of go here. And, you know, you, I, I was doing that. I was using uh, Siri in perhaps not the best way in the world, but I was using Siri so that I didn't have to um, keep answering the same question. Well, what could be better? A machine that will answer a question in several different ways, uh, maybe many different ways, and will never tire of answering it, and will not get exasperated with you for asking that question, unless you shout at her. I mean, if she'll get a little bit, uh, she'll correct you. But if you're just asking the question, it's fine. So I think that there was that element, and as I also have said, I don't know how easily back and forth conversation comes to your kids, but for Gus, it didn't come that easily. He mm -hmm. not only didn't it come easily, it really didn't come at all for a long time. He right. had a tendency to just uh, say, usually in very simple sentences, to sort of blurt whatever it was he was thinking of, sometimes to me, but sometimes, you know, to the closet or to my feet or where, wherever, and he would say what he wanted to and walk away. There was no such thing as reciprocity for a very long time right so that's what Siri also does. it's it's reciprocity you sit there and you ask a question and she'll answer but sometimes she asks a question back or sometimes she her sometimes her answer will lead to more questions exactly. as well yeah I, I love that it, it can and then she's willing to do research on that and she'll ask did you mean this which opens a whole other can of worms now right. you have you have twins so you have yes. one child who is typical one child who's typical and would always be whispering in Gus's ear to say, uh, you know, nasty things to Siri just to see the reaction. <laughs> Not nasty exactly. Let's just say racy things. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I know more about Kate Upton's uh, bra size than I care to. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> that that's where he went with that. But, uh, um, I, yeah, I mean, even he, he, he began to see the fun of it, too. And... Um, uh, I think that there are moments in our lives, and I don't think I'm wrong about this. Um, well, actually, friends told me about this, where you just, if you're having a little moment of doubt or a little moment of insecurity, <laughs> you might ask Siri a question. I, 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 you know, if I ask her right now, um, Siri, how do I look? And she'll say, See, on a scale of one to ten, I bet you're a forty-two. See, on a scale of one to ten, I bet you're a forty-two better right. and actually i happen to have siri on the uh, a guy's british voice right now i so hear that that's even better as far as i'm concerned my son would like that i'll tell you one of the things that i'm not seeing people talk about that i that i want to talk about with you is that 
one of the things that I enjoyed was we really get to see your life. We get to be involved in your life and your life is interesting, Judith. I don't know if you realize this, but Are you using interesting is a euphemism. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, your life, your life in some ways, you know, I looked at it and, and there it's, I, you're somebody I would want to be friends with, right? Oh. Uh, and, and someone that I can easily picture myself being friends with because there are things that you, the way you reference them, I go, oh, she gets it the same way that I get it. But the circumstances of your life are kind of, I think anybody would call them unconventional. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah, of course. It's fair to say. You know, I, I, as I say in the book, uh, I've been asked so many. I, my husband and I don't live together. He's right. much older than I am, and uh, I've actually I, I've been asked to do books on this, and I, I I cannot imagine a more boring book than a book about why two people don't live together. There are reasons, but it's just not. I, and and I've even I I actually um, I can't remember who I did it for now. The Guardian. I think I did a piece for it in conjunction with this because they asked me. But um, yeah, it's. It, I, I guess it is unconventional. Gee, if you want to be, I hope you'll friend me on Facebook then when this is I over. I certainly so will. I'm going to immediately go. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Um, but but sure, it's it's unconventional in that way, and you know some of that unconventionalness, uh, if that's the word, uh, was I don't know, not well. It was worrisome in the sense that many of the I have many of the. Um, uh, I'm sort of like the poster child for a mother for, of an autistic child. Mm. So, you know, the, the much older father, um, the having children, um, having twins, having children later in life, having a really a rough pregnancy where there's a lot of, you know, supposedly the science says, um, you know, with a lot of tension, there's a lot of release of cortisol, and that could have uh, reasons. So, you know, I, in the book, I speculate a little bit about this, all yeah. of the many reasons that I might have. But at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, who cares? You, you have your days of thinking about it, and then you're like, you're presented with this uh, wonderful, strange little person, and, uh, then, and life goes on. Tell us about uh, tell us about Gus now and where you what are your hopes for his future and let's talk a little bit about the future for our kids yeah. with autism. Yeah, I mean, of course, this is what keeps us up at night, right? right? We sit there and we we think to ourselves, what's going to happen when we're not here? Yeah. Um, how independent can this person be? And at three o'clock in the morning, my mind goes to the most uh, dire circumstances. You know, my mind goes to uh, my son will not have friends, my son will be homeless, um, who will he have to talk to, who will he have to cut his food even because right. at, at uh, almost 16 he still can't use a knife. Um, so every awful thing is there. And then I wake up in the morning and I see um, a person who is I don't want to say incrementally changing because I, uh, autism is strange. It's it's not incremental. It's it, at least in my experience, it's like your your kid is you know doing this this this, and all of a sudden there's this uh, jump mm -hmm. in abilities and and development. And I don't know if that's been your experience, but yes. that that's sort of been mine. Um, so I I still I say that that when I wrote this he was 14 and I say he like most kids on the spectrum he's the adorable question mark you really don't know at 14 whereas you can have a fairly good idea of your of other neurotypical child's independence at the age of 14 that right. they will be um, and so my my hopes for him and my dreams for him just are all about having a place at the table. That's mm -hmm. what I think about every day. Um, that place doesn't have to be anything exalted. It has to just be, because I know he's such a social person, um, and I know that his ability to connect with people is there, but, but you know, not like other people's. It, it is problematic for him. Um, I just want him to have a place in the community in whatever way that is. So when people say to me, well, you know, why did you write this book? And of course, I, you know, I have completely selfish reasons for writing this book. Um, and they are that my son will be remembered just a teeny bit in a few years and he will have a job because 
as I write about, he is, without being at all academic, he is more motivated to have a job than just about anyone you know. Um, and, you know, there's the problem with him, and, and maybe you've seen this with your kids, is there's always some part of a job that he can't do. There's like one thing that in, in a series of things, like, like I, I write in the, the book about how he actually kind of feels he's a, a doorman. I mean, he doesn't, but he, he does all of the doorman duties in my building, except that one thing about not keeping people out. He could never do that. Right, <laughs> so, right. So he couldn't be a doorman, really, but... I, I'm just saying that that there are ways, maybe not that, but but there are ways. I think for us as a as a culture, uh, to to find places at the table for autistic people because we have so many now around us. Um, isn't it going to be better if we help them find their niche? If we make small adjustments, because often the, the adjustments you have to make are not huge. Like I'm sure, did you see that? Um, that wonderful uh, video about the the dancing barista that that, yes, uh, that Ellen that, featured you know, went kind of viral yes. and, and Ellen. I mean, what had to happen for this kid to get a job that his dream job uh, at, at a coffee place? He it took one manager to just say to himself, eh, you know, this kid makes really good coffee. So what if he has to dance while he does it? Right, you know, right. and I, I just thought that was wonderful and beautiful. And that's what I hope happens with my son uh, more than anything else, that he finds that person who will let him do, you know, maybe maybe my son has to hop when he uh, when he talks to you, um, but he's still giving you great directions or maybe right. whatever it is. He will show up every day and he will be, the happiest, most joyful employee that you've got. Well, and you mentioned something to us in the pre-production about a story that is of interest to you right now. Uh, Darius McCollum, who is the subject of the documentary Off the Rails, we had Adam Irving, the director mm -hmm. of the, the film. It's a documentary. I think it's on Netflix or Amazon mm -hmm. right now, one of the mm -hmm. two. It's amazing documentary about th this man who his entire life was obsessed with the MTA and did everything he could to try to work for the MTA. And when they didn't hire him and wouldn't hire him, he, he took it upon himself as a very young man. He just hired himself and was often <laughs> left in charge of running trains and then would be yes. caught and arrested and do jail time. Right. And that time and time again, he had lawyers advocating for him, trying to find a way that the, he could have the job of, that he right. was if he doing. Only, if he only could do a job doing this as opposed to be getting in trouble with the law. But doing instead, this. Yeah, they keep exactly. arresting him and putting him in jail. When, when he's been, every time he, and believe me, we all understand, he confiscated the trains and he, w yeah. you know, without a license was driving them, but he was yes. always driving them safely. Right. If somebody just he gave him a little training. training. And the buses. And, and you know, people will say, they have the same answer. Well, how could you have someone like this? You know, he didn't have insurance. Who knows what he might do? And I, and I said, I know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to steal another train or bus, and he's going to drive it safely. Thank That's you. That's what he's going to do. Exactly. So, you know, it, but this is a man. I mean, this kills me. This is a man who has spent... Most uh, more than half of his life in jail over this nonsense. And when I called the MTA in the book, I call a, a, a spokesman and I asked him about this. And I, I, I you know, I, I kind of he said he talked he uh, talked to me like I was out of my mind, like I was asking the MTA MTA to hire a felon. And I'm like, well, he is a felon. He's a felon because he keeps getting arrested for doing the same thing, it, <laughs> because yeah. you've arrested him. And is this? Is there not some place that this guy could be? Yeah. And uh, apparently, you know, it's it, it's a rule. That you can't have a, a felon working for the MTA. But surely, it, here's what I think. If I won the lottery tomorrow, okay, what I would do <laughs> is I would blow, you know, like sixty thousand dollars, fifty or six, whatever it costs, to have someone shadow Darius McCollin around for like for a year to show that he was a safe person to do this job. Right. That's what I would do. And I, I wish, you know, if anybody listens to the, and, and look, I don't know Darius McCollin. There may be something 
else that I'm unfamiliar with and I'm wrong, but everything I see and read and I've talked to his lawyer, there, there doesn't seem to be anything making this an unrealistic goal. Um, so if there's somebody out there with, with big money <laughs> and they want to kind of save one person's life, that's what I suggest that they do. I love it. And you're really focused on this idea of work and, and our kids on the spectrum. I am. I am because, you know, like like a lot of nice Jewish girls, I've grown up with the idea that work, there are only two things in life that are really important, work and love. You know, right. it's that, that Freudian notion. And um, I, you, you can't, we can't control too much about love and who our kids love and when they love and if they love. But we can kind of control something about work, at least for some of them, at least for more of them. At least that, that's what I think. And so I guess I, guess I think that it, that's, that's where I like to, it, it, when, I, when I talk for this book and when I talk to people like you guys and do great shows like this, that's kind of the message I'd like to get across. Wonderful. That get our kids work, meaningful work. Meaningful work, yeah. Where, um, where and, do you see Gus 10 years from now? Well, in my dream world, what he's doing is um, doing playing to his strengths, which is being like, it, it, you don't live in, in New York City, but Grand Central, he, he spends an awful lot of time at Grand Central, <laughs> knows all the conductors. And I don't think that he, ha uh, I'm not sure if he has the coordination to actually drive a train. Uh -huh. I don't think he does. Um, I think that he he could be that guy in, who they, they have guys in the information booth who do nothing but give out information to people all day long, mm -hmm. and that would be his happy place. He could do it. He would be thrilled. Um, he could do it now. <laughs> and, um, yeah, something like that. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, if that's if – that's that seems kind of realistic to me. Um, he could do – uh, and I don't. I don't even know what it is he could do. Okay. I don't. I, I. You know. I used to to joke because he's such a friendly person who likes to make connection about being a Walmart greeter or something right. like that. That would be great for him. Yes. You know. This is not about money. This is not about um, uh, about status. This is about being part of something larger than himself. Right, yeah. And about dignity. that's what I want yeah. for him. Yeah, not finding fulfillment by having a purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. And so what about your other son? Because I hate it when we leave the siblings yes. out. And he uh, is amazing and brilliant and uh, a great. life onto himself. What, what do you think he's going to be doing in 10 years? Well... <laughs> He tells me when, one of the reasons he's barely on social media is because he plans to have a career in politics, only not here in this country. He actually, um, he, he's going to be a junior in, in college, and he wants to, at the moment anyway, he's telling me that he wants to um, go and study in, um, in England. Uh, maybe he's seen too many of those videos where they all seem to be having fun in Parliament. I don't know what the story is, but but he says he wants to go to university there. So in fact, over Christmas we're going to go and um, look at a couple of schools there. He has a British passport because my husband is English, so it, this makes a little sense. But also, he really just wants to be near his uh, Newcastle, his beloved uh, football team there. And I, I think he's planning on paying his way through uh, playing poker because that's what he. Uh, <laughs> All right. That's what he spends a lot. My whole house this summer, I, I kept walking into my house, and there were like a bunch of strange kids, uh, you know, sort of looking a little guilty and shifting chips underneath the table. Yeah. You know, kind of, I don't know what they were playing what for. What is, what is his relationship like with Gus? Well, you know, he, I, I tell people who are in a similar situation, whether it's twins or not, you've got to be really patient with your neurotypical kid and not mind if they're embarrassed or they're sometimes exasperated because of course at certain points Henry uh, was and sometimes is but he adores his brother it's finally occurred to him after years of trying to be in some competition of his own creation it's occurred to him that his brother doesn't want to compete with him isn't interested in it and is just his champion no matter what his his brother always, you know, yay, you come home with the chess chess trophy, yay, whatever it is. 
So um, even though still Henry gets a little exasperated and he says to me, oh, you know, mom, you're going to have to give me more than half the death money because I have to take care of him. I, I love the term death money. I, 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 ah. I've got to, you know, sort of clue him in that it's, I let him call it that, but I, I should probably say the word inheritance. But anyway, <laughs> you've got to do this because because Gus is, is you know, I'm going to have to do this. And, I, and I'm like, you might have to do something. Yeah, you might have to do something. I, I don't shy away from the reality of uh, the fact that he will probably have to look after his brother's interests in some way, yes. not entirely. Um, I think my, my guess uh, would be that Gus would be mostly independent mm -hmm. except for issues of money because um, mm -hmm. I, I can't, he's so trusting, I can't see how it's going to change and that he'll be able to deal with that. But who knows? Who knows? Right, right. Well, Judith, we have to say it's been such a delight to have you here. We really want to recommend that people get the book uh, to Siri with Love, and it's available in out. all the major booksellers. You can get it on Amazon. Um, and, and you have other books as well. Uh, is there a place where you'd like to send them to, in particular, our viewers? Nah, not really. I mean, it's just um, go, yeah, just go to to SiriWithLove.com or JudithNewman.com if you want to read stuff I've written. But no, just uh, wherever makes you happy. You know, <laughs> go, go into the independent bookstores if that makes you happy and just like sneak in there and turn my book, uh, you know, right side up. You know how you do that in bookstores and then just flee. That would be good. <laughs> All right. I love that. Yeah, well, yeah. it's a it's a fascinating read. You're a lovely, luscious writer. Um, I really felt like I was in New York City with you and your family, and um, it's delightful. Thank People. you so much for having me on the show.